Welcome everybody. It's great to see so many here today to this ice warm webinar, Transforming Water Data into Information and Knowledge, presented by Brian Jackson. Well, my name's Trevor Piller. I'm the National Partnerships Manager here at Ice Warm, and we are going to have an interesting time. Climate change and a fast-growing population in cities forces water professionals to deal with excessive rainfall, floods, water quality issues, longer periods of drought and rising sea levels. So easy access, right information is essential to reducing impacts. So that's what we're on about today, transforming data into information and knowledge. Look at the array of people with us today all over Australia, up through Southeast Asia, South, South Asia, India, Afghanistan, the US, South America, Nigeria, oh, Egypt, it, it's pretty big. Thank you everybody for joining us. We're gonna have a great time. There's tons of people there, so I won't waste any more time here. Um, all right, that's probably enough from me for right now. We're gonna hear from Brian. Uh, he holds a master's in hydrology. Uh, he's an adaptive water resources manager and hydrologist with 20 years of experience in implementing integrated water resources management. He's the acting CEO and specialist manager for planning and operations uh, at the first catchment management agency established in South Africa and has been at the forefront of implementing the internationally respected Water Act in South Africa. And uh, we are so delighted you could join us today, Brian, and I'm going to hand now right over to you. So thank you again. Thank you very much, Trevor. Thank you for that introduction and thank you everybody for joining in to listen to our story today. I have, as mentioned, um, my previous life was in South Africa and that was where I was first introduced to the Hydrant platform where I was managing the Kruger National Park River and there was a huge conflict over there between the farming community and the Kruger National Park themselves. Um, and as a catchment management authority over there, we had to um, find a way to fix this, this issue and manage the river and it was only through getting information and sharing that information and turning that into a decision-making process and a trust-building process and eventually a consensus-based decision-making collaboration with all stakeholders that over a number of years we actually get to a point where we are effectively managing these rivers in the Kruger National Park for all people. And it all started with information sharing and collaboration. So that led me across the pond now to, um, to Australia, down under, and um, to a project for the Goulburn Broken Catchment Management Authority that we've recently completed that I'm very happy to be presenting on today. I'm gonna to just give you an overview of, of the Catchment Management Authority themselves and where they are and their responsibilities and the particular challenges around information that they had. And then I'll go straight into the water control room that's been implemented in this functionality, as well as the perceived benefits that we feel it has provided to them. And then Trevor will take over and handle the question and answer session. So without further ado, um, obviously, Golden Broken Catchment Management Authority is, is in the Victoria state of Australia, highlighted down there. Now, um, quite unique in Australia in that it's the only state that has catchment management authorities. Um, in this case, the Golden Broken one, you can see there, there's Melbourne down in the bottom, and up top here is the Murray River, which forms the northern border of the state. So it's, it's a pretty large catchment. It forms about 2% of the area of the Murray-Darling Basin only, but actually provides 11% of the flow for that system. So a very important system, not only for itself, but also for the Murray-Darling Basin. If I zoom in a little bit, you can see it, it ranges from the Great Dividing Range in the mountains and quite nice natural areas here, to the Eildon Dam, and then into the flat areas and the Shepparton Irrigation District. So a fairly large area that has to be managed by the Golden Broken Catchment Management Authority. Now, they basically are responsible for natural resources and environmental and water quality management and monitoring. Um, they have a lot of other functions, but I'm only going to concentrate on the ones that are particularly of importance for, for this project. And with those authorities, they have to not only determine, but also make orders for environmental water releases and then monitor the catchments with environmental value. To do this, they have to collaborate with a lot of partners. There are many, many players in this game, and it's quite a complex governance arrangement. Um, but they first of all define their decision levels at different times of year and make a decision on environmental requirements and based on the current situation, either requests for releases from dams, for example, where they have to go to the likes of Goulburn Murray Water to actually make releases from those dams. Um, if a release is requested and made, then obviously it has to be monitored and the action and the effects of those actions have to be checked in the background 
And afterwards, they also have to report back to the state departments, Department of Environment, Land, and also to their stakeholders. So it's quite a complicated situation with a lot of information needed and a lot of information has to be shared. Um, because of this, they're a member of the Victorian Water Monitoring Partnership and they actually um, maintain a lot of real-time data loggers and equipment out in the field. But that all gets sent to the Water Monitoring Partnership and databases, various databases um, at different organizations. They don't have the data themselves. And that's where I suppose the, the main challenge has been is that it is located in many locations. Although it is accessible to them, it's not easily accessible, especially out in the field when they need it operationally. Um, and they don't have control over what is particularly shown and available for their particular needs. So a lot of these different databases have their web portals attached to them, but it's, it's a sort of one size fits all solution. So if they need to have information in, in the field, they've got to go and get it from, let's say, the Bureau of Meteorology for the weather data, and then they've got to go to Golden Murray's database for a lot of the environmental water quality data and various sources, and then compile it together on their systems in, let's say, Microsoft Excel and make it available. This has a very long time and cost burden and often results in it not being available time, timely in the field when they are needing to see how the systems are reacting to rainfall events and releases. Um, so they wanted to be able to provide themselves with the actual information that they need timelessly and easily in one place without causing themselves to be a burden on the various data providers. So they asked Hydronet Water Technology to implement the Hydronet Water Control Room, which is designed as a software as a service cloud platform to specifically handle these needs. Um, Hydronet being a typical um, cloud-based SaaS solution, software as a service solution, has the standard benefits of any cloud SaaS solution that you can see here. You can share the subscription costs amongst all users, which in turn reduces the maintenance and port costs, and you don't yourselves have to set up hardware and software and databases and other related IT costs to maintain that into the future. Um, you're always staying up to date with the latest developments in the IT world because software updates happen, and so on and so forth. You just subscribe and you get your support and upgrades and maintenance is happening. But it's more than just a software as a service solution. It's a software as a service platform that embraces something called the digital delta approach, which is um, an approach developed in the Netherlands that delivers services from distributed data sources over the internet and through web portals. So it basically implements secure connections that smartly link to various databases and then provides you also with smart tools and applications to visualize and easily access and use that information. Um, this can be personalized to an individual level through personal dashboards that can be set up. So the CEO down to the field staff can all get dashboard that is particularly needed for them. Um, it also, because it's creating links and not actually copying data, you don't get any duplication or versioning issues. The responsibility for data remains at source. So the Bureau of Meteorology or Golden Murray Water, who provide a lot of this data, they just maintain their data, and this platform just provides the link to the Golden Broken CMA. So there's no further burden on, on the actual database administrators of those variable, various organizations. And in the ideal situation, multiple organizations are using this and can work together and collaborate and share their information between themselves for much better collaborative decision making. So the process is, um, I'm going to go through is, first of all, we connect GBCMA to the data sources that they need, which then allows them to view and watch their data, set alerts on their data, and generate automatic reports. And I'll go through each one of these steps one by one for you. So the connection is um, pretty state of the art in terms of software cloud-based solutions. So it's HTTPS or VPN connections for, between Hydronet through the client's firewall to a web service proxy or data web service that sits on, on, on the client's database. Now this data web service basically also only allows the, allows um, access to the static IP address of Hydronet through the firewall, which is whitelisted, and handles the data requests and authentication and authorization requ requirements. So the databases themselves are very well protected and the users go through Hydronet and are only allowed to access the portion of the database that permission has been given to. 
The data that we're talking about in this particular project that has been made available is all the precipitation data, a lot of water quality parameters, water level and flow parameters, and many more to come still to be implemented, such as dam levels and so on. Once those links have been created, the organization now has its dashboard. So every individual who would like to have a dashboard gets a username and password. They log into Hydronet, and this is the login screen. Once you log in, you take into the data viewing portal, which looks like this. I'm just going to run a little video that I captured this morning of users and how they would actually add a data parameter from a particular data location, for example, and look at it. So the first thing you do is you set the time period that you're interested in. And once you do that, you can then click on add a new layer. Now you click on service water in this case. It's, it's nicely and easily, let me just pause this quickly. It's nicely and easy set up so that you can, in any way you want to, put subcategories for your data. So we would normally do water quantity or water quality as separate categories and weather as another category, for example. So you choose a category, water, water quantity in this, quality in this case, and all the parameters that are available in the database just come up as a list. We're picking operational flow, and we click finish, and all of the data locations appear in red in this case. I can then click on that location and the surface water quantity information that I'm wanting, and for the time period set, it loads it up, and you can view it. Now this is where some of the, the magic happens. I have now done three sites and I want to see them in one graph. I can just use the drag and drop functionality to make a combined graph of all three locations going down the river from, from top to bottom and play around with it. And once I'm happy with it, and this is something I want to put on the dashboard, I can then just click on the place on dashboard button and it is available for the dashboard. And what Hydronet is doing when we do this and we load these graphs, is that it is in real time linking to the Goldman Murray Aquarius database and actually downloading the information for the period that is of interest. And then it is easy to do that here. You don't have to do any post-processing or any technical knowledge or know-how. You just got to be able to drag and drop and play with the graphs that you want. The next phase on that is what we call watching. And that's basically setting alert levels. So let's say traffic light colors, red, orange and green um, for your various locations. This is a screenshot of it. You can see here that the actual individual locations have traffic light colors, and there's a legend down the left-hand side. But you can also set up polygons for areas of interest that are driven by a number of the individual sites. So these polygons, for example, in this case, are actually showing the median flow of all the tributaries in that section, which is quite low, orange. You can see uh, between 15 and 30 megaliters per day. And the um, polygon for the river here is actually showing the median flow of all of the river, the main stem gauging stations. You can see that the river itself, the main river, is flowing much more than the tributaries, which are nearly not flowing in this case. And that's because of releases that are coming out of Eildon Dam. So when this is set up, only once do you basically go into edit, and then you can set up these um, alert levels they can either be the same for every location, or you can change the alert levels for each location separately. And you can also change the alert levels for each location and for each time step every day if you want to. So Goulburn Broken, for example, have different requirements for environmental um, needs in the dry season and the wet season. So a red alert level for them is much lower in the dry season than it is in their, in their wet season. So those red alert levels change throughout the year, and that can be set up here. You can then also set up, when you click on a chart, on, on a location and get a chart, how long you want that chart for. And here you can also, um, when you look at the colors of the polygons and the dots in the background, you can see that that is actually showing the statistics for the last two weeks in this particular case. Because that can all be set up here. You choose the locations you want to do it for, and then you basically choose whether you want to show the current last available data or any statistics, which is those two weeks in this case that you show. But in this case, I'm only showing the last available data. I set up my thresholds. One that's all set up, it's done, and I can place it on the dashboard. And from there onwards, the users themselves and all the individual people within their organization, they just log into their dashboard, and they will see this information updated to the last available information um, every 15 minutes gets updated in their case. 
So all of this that I've gone through is only a one-stop setup during the process. Um, it's not needed to be done by users themselves. They can just get their dashboard. This is an example of a dashboard now for Golden Broken that has been set up. They've split their dashboards into several dashboards for their various management areas, the Lower Goulburn, Broken Creek, Mid Goulburn, Broken River, for example. Um, this is the Lower Goulburn. And if I scroll down, you can see a various number of charts that have been set up according to their requirements. River levels, Sevens Creek flows, precipitation, temperature, dissolved oxygen graphs. Now, some of them look quite busy, but you can also interact with these graphs in your dashboard. So you can zoom in, for example, like that, and play around. You can switch on and off various of the locations that are there. So you can basically get rid of what you're not interested in and just see what is needed. And you can also then download that information in various formats of pictures or even in CSV formats and play with it in Microsoft Excel, for example, if you would like to. So it provides you a lot of nice tools to not just visualize what's happening, but to also access that data and download it as you need it. If I go back to the top of the lower Goldman page, start interacting with the map. If I click on these, these, these dots, I can actually get a list of all of the various parameters that are available at that particular location. I click on the parameter that I'm particularly interested in and the graph for the last 365 days that I set up previously becomes available. You can also interact with that graph and download it as well um, in the various formats so that, that you would like to. So this is um, the dashboard that has provided access to the Goulburn Murray's water quality data, Goulburn Murray Water's water quality data on the Aquarius database, but they also get access to various Bureau of Meteorology information, and I'm just showing some examples here. Their forecasts, the um, meteograms, forecast of climate, and quite a nice one is the um, radar reflectivity data at 15 minute intervals all the way back to 2009. You get a really nice idea of where the storms were, were hitting and how they progressed through an event. So, this has provided them um, with a lot of benefits, we believe. They now have these personalized dashboards, which give them this easy access from anywhere, anytime. All they need to have is an internet connection and you can log in and view your data. So you don't have to search for that data anymore. You don't have to compile it into various formats anymore to get what you need. That's all set up once and it's already in the format you need, which gives you a lot more control over your information and allows you to concentrate on sharing that information and building the knowledge and the trust and those important things with stakeholders and collaborating with everybody. I think I've, um, I am going quickly because of the 20 minute time limit. Um, we believe once you're subscribing, all the IT hassle is ourselves. It belongs to Hydronet and you don't have any of those IT hassle related costs or hardware or software updates are all done by, by Hydronet. And no technical know-how is required to actually interact with the system. So even top management that don't do the technical day-to-day -day use of this data, the, techn the technocrats might use their own systems. But as you go up to decision-making levels, you generally don't have the technical abilities to interact with the various complicated models. They just need to look at the information and make decisions, and this provides it to them. It has these real-time live links, so you can actually now keep your eye on the water system in real time without having to have the delay of collecting everything from the various sources and combining it and processing it. Um, individual for everybody. And yeah, as I already said, the smart tools, which we believe is making transparent and accountable decisions much more available to them. Something that hasn't been set up for the Golden Broken CMA as yet, but is another functionality that is available when we get to that point is the alerting functionality. So um, real-time alerts can be set up on the thresholds and warning levels that are in the system. Those can be SMSs or, or emails to various different people, depending on a various combination of alerts. It can be as simple as just a particular gauge level, or can be a combination of a certain gauge level, a certain water quality parameter amount, and a certain rainfall amount at various gauges, weighted in various formats. You can get as complicated as you like. If all of those are met, then an alert is sent to a select set of people, for example. The final functionality that's provided, which is really helping um, the staff to do their reporting to the Department of Environment and to their stakeholders, is the um, automatic report generation abilities. So when you're in your dashboard, if you want to share that graph that you see there or that map that you see there, you can just click on the embed button and it allows you to embed your application. 
You can choose a static embed for a particular event you might be interested in, or a dynamic embed, which updates every day or every 15 minutes in this case. Um, you set that size and the lifetime of that embed and you basically click here and it creates a link. You can then just put that link into a Word document or a PowerPoint slideshow. You set up your monthly stakeholder presentation template, for example, and all of the graphs and maps you need to show are set there as, as hydronet embeds in your presentation or Word document. And then every time you open those documents, um, they all get updated automatically and you don't have to worry about updating your Excel spreadsheet and redoing your graphs every time you have to share this report. It's just done in the background for you. This is a very powerful functionality and is actually very popular uh, even with staff themselves just to um, open up the Word document every morning and get the updated information as well without having to log in. There's an example of, of embed that's created of one of those charts you see. So this is what it would look like in, in, in a presentation, for example. You can obviously change the size as you feel fit. And this is an example of an embed that's been created for Golden Broken for the Shepparton Irrigation District in their website themselves. So that the map you see there is a, is a hydronet embed that's running with the hydronet control room and allows users to click on all of these borehole water levels that you see there. And if they click on a level, they get a graph of the current water level depth against the, um, the salinity alert level, which is that red dotted line you see on the top. So if that water depth gets quite close to that red line, then there is a salinity um, alert in place for that particular area or those boreholes. So we believe this actually saves a lot of time. I'm, I'm pretty sure a lot of us spend a lot of time in Excel making reports. Um, you can just do it at one click of a button once you've set up all your report templates once off. This increases awareness as well and is also enabled to do this with Esri Arc Online. So many organizations use Esri Storyboards Arc Online for their public portals. And if you set up a storyboard for your water resource status, you can also use Hydronet to just generate the embeds and the information that will show you in that storyboard at the click of a button. It's a pretty powerful functionality that they now have at their fingertips. So in summary, we believe we have solved this problem that you see on your screen here, which is not too much to do and not enough time to do it. A lot of various questions coming from various people internally and externally, asking information related to water, but all, all different. You can set up personalized dashboards for each of these people. You can set up reports or PowerPoints for various people and focus more on making the right decisions and ensuring that your data is correct and collaborating with your partners. I have been through this journey myself in South Africa, as I said at the beginning, and it was a very interesting process of stakeholder collaboration as well as the very technical um, flood forecasting modeling and the sharing of all of this information to help the decision making through this hydrogen platform. i um, written a paper on it recently and it's been very, very successful turning that system around. And the environmental compliance in the Crocodile River now has increased probably 50% from what it was the 10 years before that was implemented. So it really does help you to concentrate on the actual task at hand other than just getting information. So Trevor, I, once again, thank you very much for the opportunity to present on this. It's been a great project. We've really enjoyed it. The Golden Broken have been using it recently in some events, and uh, we believe they're very happy with it. Yep. And so are we. And it's, we're been, happy to share it. it's been fantastic, Brian. I, I can only quote to you one of the comments on the chat, chat screen going through the, the uh, as you were going through the presentation. Uh, this is a fantastic tool. And I think this is a pretty widespread feeling. There's a few questions coming up right now, and we appreciate that, everybody. Uh, thanks for your patience. There's tons of people on this um, webinar today, and there are quite a few questions to get through. So well, let's get straight into it. But look, I do encourage you to raise your hand, and we'll uplift you to come on the screen. That'll be really good to chat directly with Brian. We'd love that. Um, or if not, then certainly um, get the Q&A icon and uh, type out your questions. Thank you. Yes. Appreciate that. Uh, the, the, the sort of people I want to just give a shout out to today are Yogita Deshora from India. She was a fellow here studying here at Ice Warm uh, a, a few weeks back. And Ed Donahue, nice to have you presenting in the Groundwater School years ago. And, the, and also Basant uh, Maheshwari of Mavi fame. It's, been, it's great to see you. And in Nigeria, Sogo, we, we appreciate you joining us. Uh, well, there's a whole lot more I could, I could call out from the US and Japan and other places. Uh, thanks for joining us, everybody. Um, Let's get into these questions. 
Uh, first up, um, Milit Shah has asked, what system did Goldburn CMA, that's a uh, um, um, catchment management authority, use prior to Hydronet for making operational decisions and what benefits have they seen? Yeah, I'm, I suppose I tried to highlight at the beginning where they didn't really have a particular system in place. They had a number of different systems available to them through the Mon Water and Monitoring Partnership where there were um, web portals and databases that provide a lot of the information, um, but also the Bureau of Mutuology. So they would have to log into these various um, systems and get the information they needed and actually have them open in different, let's say, tabs, yep. and download it and collate it and reprocess it. So it was a manual task that took a lot of time and that did actually make a problem for field staff operationally, where they really didn't actually have operational information out in the field. Um, when it was needed during events because it took too much time to get the information. And that is why they've spent the money to set up a, a system that can actually do that for them now without bothering others and having to spend the huge of money to put your own database in place and your own server mm, yeah. and your own software and hardware to make it run. There's a great advantage. Uh, she goes on to say, Miller goes on to say, how much investment did they make in dollar terms for incorporating the HydroNet system? How did they transfer... Second question, have they transferred their existing models and over what period of time? So it's a bit of a complex yeah. question. So this there. project was six months. So um, Hydra is designed as, as, as a ready, ready to go, you know, um, so software as a service solution. The functionality is already there. It's, 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 it's um, a two phase process of um, a one soft configuration process where for your particular case, all of the data that you need in databases are connected to. And that has a, that's like a consulting project in a way which has a cost that's um, case specific. So depending on, on, on the various amounts of databases and how much information you need to connect to, um, that will be a cost specific. Um, and that's an interesting process where we do a functional design and we, we brainstorm the dashboards and that you need and the various different dashboards and we come up with a functional design document through that process. We then link to the data and yeah, we can only quote on a case by case basis. And then you subscribe to Hydronet from there onwards. And the standard functionality of Hydronet is in the order of $25,000 per annum, which we think for this kind of functionality, if you were to do it as a typical traditional solution, it costs you a lot yeah. more. Yeah, absolutely right. Absolutely right. Now we've got a question now from um, Bhutan. Uh, goodness knows what time it would be there, probably 5 or 6 a.m., but thanks for joining us, Dawa. We really appreciate it. He says, I'm trying to have water quality monitoring stations in some of the schools in Bhutan. It's mostly to educate students and include the data information for, for their practicals. Therefore, could you please advise some basis, basic equipment which can monitor physical, chemical properties of water? Probably not for this. Well, uh, probably not something I can really advise on because yeah, we don't actually do the um, in-field equipment and, and monitoring and telemetry. Um, we take it from the databases that that equipment sends it to and we actually then make it available from there. So I can't really advise on equipment. Um, I know a lot of my colleagues can, can do advice Sorry. and they can actually send so other we, companies that do it, but not so us. So we could, we could point them in the, in the right direction then, yeah. Brian. I'll tell you what, Dawa, what we'll do after the uh, webinar's over, we'll shoot out Brian's um, contact details and uh, maybe have a chat with him on more specific parts of the, um, of the issues around, around um, uh, transforming uh, data into information that, and those particular equipment issues you could point him in the right direction yeah all right uh, David Nyquist says could can you add pumping bore locations and associated pumping data volumes and water levels yes absolutely um whatever data you have in whatever databases it's at we can add that information it's designed to connect to um, all of the various um, mainstream databases out there that are web enabled and even if you only have a web spreadsheet for example and your data sits on a spreadsheet you just put it on an FTP location and we can link to it from there it's yep. specifically designed to sort yep. out that problem that you would otherwise have to do manually yourself we yep. create those links here so yeah, yeah. That's, that sounds great another one here from India Dr. Sampat uh, would you see water accounting data which I take the water accounting data I take to mean the physical properties so the the actual data of water not not the financial issues do you see water accounting data to organize on a real-time basis can you organize the data on a real-time basis? Yes, you can. I mean, it's, it's, in this case, it's all about if you are storing that information somewhere and you need to then have a nice dashboard to visualize it, it can be visualized if, if it's on a database, in short. 
and um, water uh, water accounting can mean different things, I suppose. But I also understand it slightly differently as as an indication of uh, the sort of water balance of rainfall and runoff inputs and and um, losses and accruals and uses and and all these various things. And you get sort of like a chart of how much water is available in various groundwater and surface water and losses and inputs and that. So if that information is being updated in real time <laughs> and it's stored somewhere. Can pretty certainly be linked to. Yep, yep, uh, sounds good. Uh, another one here, uh, Brian Catherine Thompson from the Department of Water and Environment in uh, Western Australia in Perth says, "Can you include more complex graphics on dashboards, e.g., Surfer Three, dimensional contour plots of water quality?" That's a good question. So um, the standard functionality that enables you to do a number of different types of, of graphs and graphics. Um, forget. The name actually, uh, we're using some some graphics provider that's quite readily available on the internet. And if you went to that, it will show you all the various ways you could actually show graphics. So it can be set up to show it in a number of ways. The standard ways is is either you show a number of different locations on one graph, or for a particular location you show the information and the threshold levels driving the traffic light colours in the background. That's the standard two ones. Uh, we can set up other ones that would just probably involve one sort of costs and, and development. And what would normally happen is if, if there are a number of users subscribing that have this functionality that they need, it gets prioritized in the development list. And then in new releases, once it's developed, it would become available to all. So you would either wait, ask for that functionality and wait for it to reach the top of the priority list and get developed. Or if it's an urgent need, you pay for the development yourself and then others will benefit from your, your, your payment. <laughs> So sometimes yeah, no. you would pay, other times you wouldn't pay, but win and lose, I guess. That seems to be the way of it, that's for sure. Uh, a, one, a great question now from Basant Maheshwari, University of Western Sydney. Uh, and hi, Basant, thank you for joining us. It's, it's great. Basant presented a, um, a webinar for us a couple of months ago on Marvi, uh, Manager Aquifer at Village Level. Uh, so it was a great presentation. But Basant says, um, thanks, Brian. Great presentation, very useful way to collect and share information. Do you have an app for your system? And also, can this system be ad adapted for groundwater level and groundwater quality data? It's a really yes. question. Yes, so um, we do have an app. Uh, we also have a mobile website version. So if you go onto the website with your phone, for example, um, on the internet, on your phone, it'll show it as a mobile version. Um, there is an Android app that's in development and a um, our phone iPad app that's in development. But both of those are in development will be released in the not too distant future. Um, the second part of that question was about groundwater database. Yes, of course, we already are linking to their groundwater database. They just yeah. didn't themselves, the environmental chaps didn't need to see it in their dashboard, so it wasn't added to the dashboards. But it's there, and if they have the need for the dashboard, we create that dashboard in a matter of hours. Sounds good. Uh, one here from Pakistan, uh, Famida Perveen. Uh, she's a scientist in the Pakistan CSIR labs uh, in Karachi. Uh, she's a senior, senior scientist there. Did, and uh, Famida says, does it show the land use information as well while showing the groundwater level data so you can have a quick think about fluctuation in groundwater levels? Yes, yeah, so um, an example is if you have these web embeds, you can um, provide a number of background layers. If one of those background layers is, is a land use data and you have that as a shape file, it can be set as, as a background layer, for example, on top of the actual hydronet driven data that's being shown. So that's how we would, we would handle that. Um, you just provide the shape file yep. that you need and it gets set up as a background layer. Yep. Um, the standard background layer you see is, is open street maps, but others can be added if that's what yep. you require. Mm. That sounds great. Um, Simon Knowles, who's up in Loxton in uh, South Australia, up in the River Murray from Earthwise uh, Services Consultancy, uh, he says, how does the system work with poor mobile phone coverage in remote areas? Can data be preloaded for remote access with no coverage? The standard application at the moment is not. So the, the data is um, is there in the database, but you won't be able to access it without, without um, internet coverage. I know that the new version is, is being worked on to do that, some kind of pre-caching 
of information. But if it's pre-cached and you go out two hours or three hours into the into the middle of nowhere, then you're not going to be able to get the latest three hours anyway. Only the last time you would have internet coverage. So if you were to open up your browser while you left the office, you would get the latest information anyway. Um, in an, in essence, and and you can't actually access it while you don't have coverage. Yeah, that makes, um, that makes sense. If I can just add quickly for the other one, I just want to make sure people understand that as a subscription service, you know, it's a typical Spotify or Office 365 type situation where you get standard functionality that's available quick to install and set up and subscribe to. Um, all of the customization questions that have been asked can be done, but then, then, then you just have added time and, and cost on that. It's designed to give you a lot of tools um, to work with your data um, as best as you can that the general community thinks is the tools that they need. So um, that's when you get the best benefit of it, of quick time and low cost to install. Mm -hmm. When you want to start doing a lot of customization, it adds. Yeah. Yep. Optional extras on your BMW. Yep, yep. <laughs> Everything has a price. Yeah. Uh, Paul Raper asks, can the HydroNet system be used to provide data to a member of the public from a data provider's database in response to an inquiry. I'm not dead sure how that, that, that yeah. works. You might have asked that again, so, Paul, but what, you, you get that, Brian? Yeah, I got that. So it's designed primarily to be used by organizations and water professionals in that organization and different organizations that right. collaborate. It does, it can send out information to the public, but it does that via, in, in most cases we would use, let's say, an ARC online storyboard or, or a WMS layer that just provides that information on somebody's website. As a, as a web embed or WMS layer. So it doesn't provide it as part of an inquiry. Um, so you can't as a public go into this database inquiry for a specific set of data and it'll provide you through the public. The reason it does that is that if you allow that functionality, you can get inundated with requests <laughs> during an event and it'll actually cause the system to fail and the people managing the system don't need that system to fail. They need to be able to control the information that's going out and the uh, and the um, stop their servers, I suppose their systems from getting inundated. Yep. So yeah, it set, you set it up what you think the public needs and you can talk to them through stakeholder process and agree with them what information they wanna see and then you set up those web embeds on your website. But it's not through inquiry that are specific to individuals asking for data. Yeah, yeah. Um, there's a question here from Milit Shah, in uh, and she's saying that in Australia, he's saying in Australia, which data providers have shown interest in working with HydroNet? So I guess who are the clients? Uh, yeah, well, we um, the main one we actually work with is, is the Bureau of Meteorology. We, we're, we're an added value on supplier for the Bureau of Meteorology. So we use a lot of their information. And I suppose the, the very the cool thing that we provide is, is the real-time calibrated radar info information that the Bureau of Meteorology don't do in real time and to, to a lot of clients. Um, and also the Goulburn Murray Water um, shares their data, obviously, Golden Broken, Shepparton City Council. Um, up in Queensland, we have an, a number of, of, of users, the city, for example, the Reconstruction Authority of Queensland. Um, there are a number. There was a European Space Agency, weirdly enough, project to set up HydroNet in, in Australia. They, they wanted to see a lot of their data being used as well. Mm. And the European um, Centre for Meteorological or Medium Term Weather Forecasting also provides their data into their system. So you get a lot of good ensemble forecasted information too, which is quite nice if you would like yeah. to get. Hmm. Martin O'Rourke, uh, we're going to make this the last one now, but Martin O'Rourke has said, what is your website you're referring to? I seem to have missed it. I mean, there is um, a Hydronet website. Yeah, if you just want to know general information about Hydronet, um, it's www.hydronet.com.au. But the actual portal that, that subscribers interact with is portal.hydronet. Dot com. Yep. Yep. Um, but you can't access that portal unless you have the login credentials because that's where you would get your personalized dashboards when you log in. But you can get more information by going to hydronet.com.au. Yep, yep. Uh, I've got one other question here from Laurie Day uh, from the Clarence Valley Council in New South Wales, Australia. Uh, just wondering if you could comment on the difference between this system and Water Outlook. I can't because I don't know what Water mm. Outlook is. No, that's fine. That's absolutely fine. We don't have any more questions on the panel today, Brian, and I'm 
really hoping, I was hoping that somebody would put their hand up and ask a question on the face to face, but look, everybody's um, got a ton of questions coming through and we appreciate that everyone. Uh, thanks so much for joining us and uh, maybe we'll round it out now. And uh, just to say, thank you that you've participated today, everybody. It's been a huge number of people. Um, we've got a few webinars coming up, as you can see on the screen there right now. Um, uh, Liverpool cities, uh, future of the water industry, that's a big one. Uh, uh, good water governance. Anyway, I won't go into each one in detail, but the one in yellow is the one I want to highlight. The Smart Water Summit is, is coming up and we'd love you to be a part of that if you can make it to Adelaide in uh, late March. That'd be terrific. A couple of courses down there, Hecrass water modelling and getting to know groundwater. Um, as we finish off now, there will be a survey comes up on your screen automatically. If you could just fill that out, we'd appreciate that. And we will send you a recording and uh, some certificates for having participated today. Uh, we've really appreciated your uh, effort, everybody taking this time out of your day. And uh, so much um, uh, we thank uh, uh, Brian Jackson for his time today. We're going to round it off now and we hope to see you again at, at the next webinar. Bye, everyone.